Yep. All right, good morning. So you, you uh, should have in front of you, folks, Lesson 133, the 1990s, the development of progressive dispensationalism. So we're sort of turning a corner here this, this week with the studies, and I, the way I perceive things to be going is we're sort of turning a corner toward the home stretch. The last big subject matter that I want to talk about with the class is progressive dispensationalism. And then I want to talk at the very end about uh, some trends maybe that are going on right now within the Grace Movement and Dispensational Theology, and then some sort of summary lessons that I think we should take from this or learn from this. So I just want to, as we get started, before we get into the notes about progressive dispensationalism, I just want to be clear about a couple points, okay? 1909, that marker's seen its better days, 1909 is when the first edition of the Schofield Reference Bible is published, okay, the SRB. I don't remember the exact year, but sometime in the late 60s, do you know the exact year on the new Schofield? Um, 67. 67. So 67, you have the new Schofield Reference Bible that is put out. Now the reason I'm starting with this is because I just want to, I just want to make sure that everyone's clear about something. The Schofield Reference Bible is, is generally viewed as being emblematic of what's called traditional or classical dispensationalism. Okay? The, school, the new Schofield Reference Bible is sort of viewed as emblematic of what's called revised dispensationalism. Okay, now, obviously both of these are, are with respect to specifically uh, the traditional view of the church's orgia in Acts chapter 2. These terms are not necessarily referring to the grace movement uh, per se. So within, within the history of dispensational Bible study, it's generally understood that the, or, or viewed that 1909, the Schofield Reference Bible, is emblematic of classical dispensationalism. Under classical, you would, you would have, uh, you'd have Schofield, you'd have Chafer, um, and, and, and some men like that. And then 1967, new Schofield Reference Bible, that's viewed as revised dispensationalism. And I think under here, you'd have Ryrie, you'd have Walverd. Um, McLean, you, you have some of those names under here, okay? Now, progressive dispensationalism is going to be a new thing, uh, a new movement other than these two, okay? Now, it's going to have its roots and so forth in what was going on back here, but it's, it's going to really come to fruition in the 1990s. So if you look at your notes, the first point I want to talk about is the advent of progressive dispensationalism. And I must admit to you that when it comes to the history of P what I'm just going to say is PD, just to keep things easy, I'm still gleaning information. Uh, Brother Merrick, Brother Mike just handed me this this morning, uh, Grace Theological Journal, which is from 1989, that, that talks about, has a series of articles in it that talk about some of the early discussions uh, that even predate some of the information that I had available when I put this lesson together. So, the advent of progressive dispensationalism. Uh, PD is a movement that began to take shape among academic evangelical theologians in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, I, I say it that way because if you went out to the average Christian, average you know, dispensational believer and asked them what pro progressive dispensationalism is, probably many of them aren't going to know. So the, the origin of this way of thinking about dispensational theology has its, has its origin in academic evangelical theology, in the professors and so forth that are teaching in the, in the institutions are discussing these things, and they sort of lead to this, this, this movement, if you want to call it that, or this way of viewing dispensational theology. In 1993, Craig A. Bleising and Daryl L. Bach published Progressive Dispensationalism, in chapter one titled The Extent and Variations of Dispensationalism, they offer the following introductory remarks regarding the advent of PD. Quote, progressive dispensationalism offers a number of modifications to classical and revised dispensationalism, which brings dispensationalism closer to contemporary evangelical biblical interpretation. Although the name is relatively recent, the particular interpretations that make up this form of dispensationalism have been developing over the past 15 years. 
Sufficient revisions had taken place by 1991 to introduce the name Progressive Dispensationalism at the National Meeting of the Evangelical uh, Theological Society that year. This present book, along with publications, Dispensationalism, Israel, and the Church, The Search for Definition, and The Case for Progressive Dispensationalism, are key representatives of this viewpoint. So I'm, I'm just going to use his, his date, and I'm going to write 1991, and Progressive Dispensationalism up here on the board. And the reason I'm doing it that way is because that's, that's the form of it that we're going to be discussing. When, when we're going to be discussing in this class progressive dispensationalism, we're going to be talking primarily about those major books that were written in the early 1990s. Okay? What you need to understand from what, what the, the authors of progressive dispensationalism are saying is that this, sort of com this term comes and is introduced at a meeting of the Evangelical Theological, Theological Society in 1991, and it had been, been being discussed for about 15 years, according to their testimony, uh, prior to that point. So obviously that would put you back in the late 70s when the members of, when they began these discussions regarding progressive dispensationalism. Now I also want you to notice in that quote that he mentions, or they mention, these two. They mention specifically classical dispensationalism, and they mention specifically revised dispensationalism, and then the third type that they're going to be advocating for in their book, uh, Blasing and Block is, or Box, sorry, is, is PD or progressive dispensationalism. So we're going to just use 1991 as a general um, marker because that's when they sort of go public with that terminology, understanding though that it's sort of been percolating there uh, for a while beneath the surface. And I also want to point out from this quote that, again, this is happening at the Evangelical Theological Society. So this is not, you know, a meeting of laymen or, you know, just, just you know, your every average day church-going evangelical Christian. This is happening amongst meetings of professional academic theologians that are having these discussions. Would you, Dr. Wu, would you say that would be fair? Carry yeah, on? yeah, absolutely. So after 15 years of discussion and refinement, I'm on the, the next point now, the descriptor PD was first used at a meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society in 1991. The lessons in this sequence are, are not interested in surveying the development of PD over time. Rather, we are interested in understanding and evaluating PD in its mature form. Okay, So that's kind of another way of saying what I've already stated. I'm not going to try to go back to the late... 70s at this point, and trace the development of progressive dispensationalism. What I'm interested in for the purposes of this class is that we understand mature progressive dispensationalism as, as it is articulated in these major books that are coming out in the early 1990s. Okay? Everybody understand that? So according to uh, Blasing and Bach, the goal of this 15-year process of development brought dispensationalism, quote, closer to contemporary evangelical biblical interpretation. This, of course, implies that those who were involved in this process believe that classical and revised dispensationalism manifested enough problems that it placed it out of step with, quote, contemporary evangelical biblical interpretation. So what they're saying is that the discussions over a 15-year time period that eventually manifested itself in the early 90s with this specific type of dispensationalism were conducted because the theologians involved in those discussions viewed that both and or classical and revised dispensationalism were in some way out of step with mainline evangelical theology. Okay, And I'm getting that not from my own opinion, I'm getting that straight from what they say um, in, in, the, in the opening quote of the book. So there's going to be then an attempt to try to reconcile dispensational theology with what they perceive to be mainline evangelical theology or biblical interpretation. All right. Any questions so far? Yeah, Fred. I'm not familiar with this evangelical theological society. Can you identify that a little bit? Or? <laughs> I'd defer to you on that question if you would want to answer that. Well, it's an organization of, as Brian says, of academic 
um, of evangelical scholars who meet nationally once a year and regionally uh, all over the country, smaller smaller regions. And they simply subscribe. What holds it together is that they subscribe to a very strong statement about the Trinity and about um, inerrancy inspiration of Scripture. That's their basic doctrinal platform. So they don't differ, we don't differ from them, they don't differ from us in that basic respect. But there are lots of varieties of viewpoints within the ETS. Yesterday we just finished a uh, regional Midwest meeting of the, of the society, which I attended because I'm a member. Uh, so it's, it's, a going, it's a going organization. The, the national meetings are huge. I mean, it's several thousand people. Mike, Mike, he, he's right, and, and the, the emphasis on the, the commonality is the, the inerrancy of the scripture. These people all had to subscribe. This was an organization of evangelicals, not um, some ecumenical thing. Um, no, no, it's and, not. And, 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 but beyond that, you could pretty much discuss anything you wanted to, in sure. my understanding. And the papers that I read do that. But, but, but the inerrancy of scripture was the main glue that um, held this group together. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, I appreciate that perspective. Did you get your question answered then, Fred? No, that was it. Okay, good. All right, so next point. Three major works, all published within the same two-year window, capture the essence of the progressive dispensational movement. They include 1992, Dispensationalism, Israel and the Church, The Search for Definition, edited by Craig uh, Blasing and Daryl L. Bach. That, that book is more of a collection of essays written by a variety of different uh, authors that they've sort of edited and compiled into a single volume. Okay? Then 1993 <coughs> saw, and I, I'm not sure if these are in the right order or not in the right order uh, as far as exact date of release, but uh, 1993 saw the case for progressive dispensationalism, the interface between dispensational and non-dispensational theology published by Robert uh, Saucy. Saucy? Yeah, Saucy. 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 In 1993 also saw pro just progressive dispensationalism published by Blasing and Bach. So those three books are the main um, sources of information that we're going to be using to understand progressive dispensationalism. So for the purposes with the Grace History Project, we have elected to limit the majority of our study of PD to the last two books listed above because they are a more mature presentation of the major arguments of progressive dispensationalism. So I had to make some decisions with my time. I could, I, so I decided I was going to focus on those latter two uh, primarily. That's not to say that I'm not going to have anything to say about that other one um, as we go through here. But the majority of the time is going to be spent looking at what... Um, the case for progressive dispensationalism and progressive dispensationalism have to say regarding the matter. Okay? So, many critics of PD have viewed the full title of Robert Susi's book, The Case for Progressive Dispensationalism, The Interface Between Dispensational and Non-Dispensational Theology, as encapsulating the main motive of, of PD, i.e. to reconcile dispensational and covenant theology as theological systems. It is to this introductory matter that we now turn our attention. Um, so, some will say that the main objective of progressive dispensationalism is to reconcile various forms, be it classical or revised, it, with covenant theology, and the result then would be progressive dispensationalism. Now certainly not everyone would characterize it that way, but some, some have as they've, you know, read these books and tried to evaluate the arguments that are being made. So, the, the majority, in fact all, of the rest of the lesson basically is going to be taken up with understanding their view of progressive dispensationalism and what they call the mediating view. Okay, When they say mediating, they mean, me, that, that term is coming from the book by uh, Soce, and it is talking about it being a mediating view between dispensational and non-dispensational theology, as the subtitle of the book would indicate. So the first chapter of, of Susie's book titled The Critical is book titled, the first chapter is titled, sorry, 
The critical issue between dispensational and non-dispensational systems represents PD as a mediating position between dispensational and non-dispensational systems of theology. Um, he does use this term non-dispensational very heavily rather than the term covenant theology. Um, if you read the book, he will mention covenant theology, but his, his terminology of preference when talking about theology that's not dispensational is to simply call it non-dispensational theology. Um, that's readily apparent if you when, when you read the book. So at the outset of chapter one, Susie, Susie states the following regarding the, the history of discussion between dispensational and non-dispensational theology. Quote, throughout the history of discussion between dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists, numerous points of contention have been raised. These differences stem largely from the particular emphasis of each system in its understanding of biblical history. As its name indicates, the dispensational view tended to emphasize the difference in the various periods of human history brought about through progressive revelation of God's salvation program. Now, that should not be new, right? We've studied from Darby on forward many, many dispensational systems in this class. We spent a lot of time talking about um, the Schofield Reference Bible. We spent a little bit less time talking about the new Schofield Reference Bible. But I did, we did do a whole lesson on the dispensational covenantal rift, talking about um, how the uh, Presbyterian Church, you know, came out against dispensational theology and how there was a, there was a reaction against it, which is or in reaction to what the, the uh, Presbyterians had said and how that is typically uh, encapsulated in the New Schofield Reference Bible. I showed you how all of the points of contention that the Presbyterians had with the notes in the Schofield Reference Bible, that those notes were eventually revised in the New Schofield Reference Bible. Okay, So there, this shouldn't be anything necessarily new, that dispensational theology, like if you just go back to that point, emphasized the difference in various periods of human history brought about through the progressive revelation of God's salvation program. That's basically, obviously, what dispensational theology is. Non-dispensationalists, on the other hand, incline toward an emphasis on the unity of God's work in biblical history. So, So using their terms, non-dispensational theology was perceived as emphasizing a unity in God's working and dealing with man in history via uh, progressive revelation, whereas both of these are sort of viewed more as representing disjointed or very segmented or regimented views of how God is working where the primary emphasis of non-dispensationalism is, is this idea of the unified you know, uh, purpose and plan of God throughout history. So a point of criticism that non-dispensationalism has made against both classical and revised dispensationalism has been that there, these systems don't demonstrate, don't, don't do enough to show the continuity of what God is trying to accomplish through history and that's been the criticism of non-dispensationalism uh, historically. Yeah. Back to my previous question, and I would assume that this group includes uh, non-dispensationalist -dispens well, theologians as well as as the dispensational theologians, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very I mean, anybody so. because they would agree with the iner inerrancy of scripture. Yeah. There. It, the. The committee, the, the committee, the the group that's meeting to discuss these has representatives of both viewpoints. So they're all coming together to try to get along, basically. Uh, if you want to view it that way, I yeah, that's an easy way, I guess, of, of looking at it. They're they're trying to reconcile their major differences of, of thought. So next point or next paragraph from the quote: Continued study of the scriptures has seen development and modification of both perspectives. Most dispensationalists would acknowledge that some of the early statements of distinctions were overstated. 
This is often the case when a position is first espoused against another position, as was the early situation, as was the situation of early dispensationalism against traditional covenant theology. At the same time, the rise of the discipline of biblical theology, with its emphasis on interpreting the scriptures in their historical environment, has contributed to a greater appreciation of the development uh, within the historical redemptive plan and the resultant differences entailed on the part of many non-dispensationalists. So, again, just to sort of try to summarize that for you, non-dispensationalism's primary objection to dispensational theology is you guys overemphasize distinctions. You made too many. You made too many divisions. And some of them aren't legitimate, I guess would be a way of looking at it. The, tr the, the way that dispensationalism has responded here is, you guys haven't made what? Enough. You haven't made enough. You haven't delineated enough distinctions in the way God has dealt with man progressively over time. Okay? So, th these, these guys here would perceive these guys as, again, being too unified and not, not giving a, 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 a full enough understanding of what was happening in the Scripture, whereas these guys would view the, the dispensationalists as being too, too um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Segmented. Too segmented, too divided, too over-dividing things. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Prior to noting areas where tension still exists between dispensational and non-dispensational theology, Susie uses the rest of the section to note, quote, those areas for those areas which for many interpreters are no longer in dispute. Under the heading Resolved Issues, Susie comments on the following topics. Okay? So I'm just going to list these here. Law and grace. The second one, <clears throat> Sermon on the Mount. The third one, Kingdom of Heaven, Kingdom of God. I said there were four, I'm sorry. So Kingdom of Heaven slash Kingdom of God. So, let me just try to explain to you what's going on here, okay? And if you see, if you see it different, um, I'd be curious to, to know that. Oh, I'm anxious to hear your comments. <laughs> Uh-oh. So, so, what happens is when the Presbyterian Church reacts against classical dispensationalism, they do so on a few fronts. Some of them are encapsulated in these three items right here, okay? So what happens then is this next generation of dispensationalists revises some of their positions with respect to some of these things here as a, as a, as a response to the criticisms. That's sort of, to me, a simple way of, of trying to understand it, okay? So when he says, when, when, when Susie writes here in this, in this chapter, and he talks about how law and grace, sermon on the mount, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God are, are, are resolved issues. What he means by that is both dispensational and non-dispensational theologians have largely accepted the response to the criticisms that were developed by revised dispensationalism. So therefore... They're, they're, they're sort of settled issues and they're no longer, you know, out, they're no longer necessarily out there. Now, within these three, you know, let's just take the Sermon on the Mount. Obviously, there are many within the Mid-Acts Grace Movement that, w that would say that's not a settled issue at all, okay? Uh, maybe some would even say that about the Law and Grace issue. But you need to understand that the comments here that, that I'm trying to explain to you are from the point of view of, of the, you know, the academic theologians that are discussing these things, not necessarily from the, you know, the people that are sitting in, in, in assemblies and so forth. So if you look at the next rest of that point, since many of these same subjects were discussed in Lesson 113, the Covenantal Dispensational Rift, we refrain from commenting on these sections at this time. 
Suffice it to say, Sufi, uh, Susi cites the fact that recent works on dispensationalism by non-dispensational authors make no mention of different ways of salvation as proof that law and grace are no longer a divisive issue between the two theological systems. Regarding the Sermon on the Mount and the Kingdom of Heaven and the Kingdom of God, Susie gives the impression that there is more continuity between dispensationalists and, and, and non-dispensationalists and how they view these subjects than there was in the past. Okay? Yeah. Um, I think a major issue that covers both points, one, law and grace, and two, Sermon on the Mount, over which there was so much strife, and still is perhaps some, was the fact that um, early, some, many, a number of early dispensationalists in America took the view that salvation was by works in the Old Testament. And, and the reaction to that was no, salvation was never by works. But the, the problem still remains as to the relationship between salvation and works in the Old Testament. It's clear in the New Testament that, or at least in Paul, that, that's, that there cannot be any salvation by works at all. But the question then is, on number two, does the Sermon on the Mount teach salvation by works? So those are, those are, that, that's a, sort of the crux of this law and grace. And that is still, and still I, 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 I perceive that to be an ongoing discussion. And I will just add to your point, and then I'll let you reply. I can tell you of certainty that the question of Old Testament justification is not even settled within Brother Jordan's circle of the grace movement. Those, there, are, there are men that are on opposite sides of even of that particular issue, and so I, I would perceive it to be not very settled at all from my perspective. No. Um, I think that it's, there's a good possibility that either the second or third issue of the New Journal of Grace Theology is going to uh, carry some articles on the the difficulties with law, with salvation in the Old Testament. So maybe we're going to start talking about that in a serious way. Well, I mean, I'm very sure we're going to because it was a subject that came up in the Frankfurt uh, uh, Theology Summit two years ago, which was strictly within the Grace Movement. So they wanted they wanted a discussion of this. The, the group asked that we renew the journal in order at least for one thing. So let me ask you then, Dr. DeWay, your perception then, would you agree then with Susie that these are resolved or not? Um, I think I think he means they're, they were resolved in the discussions between Covenant Theology and yeah. the, the group that represents progressive dispensationalism. It's not the same as saying those issues are, re, are resolved within the Grace Movement. Right. Any other questions? You have a question, Mike? Well, it, it, I remember coming out to be, being in the Schofield uh, camp as a young believer and really being confused by by reading reading um, things about the statements on the Sermon on the Mount in the New Schofield Bible. When after being taught uh, that the Sermon on the Mount had really no application to us today, and the Schofield Bible said just the opposite. And I really was confused, confused by it. Yeah. But primarily, this discussion was was taking place with how law and grace and sermon them out in the Acts two camp. When I started reading some of the grace authors um, of the '60s and '70s and '50s, they dealt with that a little bit. They, they they at least tried to deal with it. But the the Schofield people for like Dallas Seminary and Talbot and Grace, they they were really had problems with that. And they were just in a reactionary mode to the covenant theologians who really went after them during the, during the 30s and 40s when Schaefer was around. Your statement about the Sermon on the Mount then is this New Schofield Reference Bible is emblematic then of a revised dispensational it's view also called on modified that. Or modified Yeah, some people use a different word. It's modified absolutely. Is. Is. So, yeah, if we just turn to the Sermon on the Mount section, it would be different. Okay. Good, good discussion. Uh, next point on page three. 
The major bone of contention between dispensational and non-dispensational theology, according to Susi, centers around God's purpose and plan in biblical history. Susi does not view the fundamental, the fundamental issue between dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists as, quote, a basic hermeneutical principle, literal versus spiritual, not, uh, a basic, not the all, uh, I'm going to have to check that sentence. That does not read the way I remember it reading. A basic hermeneutical principle, literal versus scriptural, not the ultimate purpose of, of human history. What he's saying there is, when you, when you pick up books, um, when you pick up, for example, Charles Ryrie's book, Dispensationalism Today, one of the first things, one of the early chapters in that book is this chapter on hermeneutics. And what he's talking about is the fact that, that the difference between dispensational and covenant theology is explainable by the difference in hermeneutical approach between a literal reading and a, a, a spiritualized or an allegorical reading. What, what he's saying there, what, what Susie's saying is the primary difference is not literal versus allegorical hermeneutic. The primary difference is what is the overall goal of history? Okay? What is the overall goal of, of, of the history of salvation outlined in the Scripture? What's the purpose for it? He's saying that is the main difference between um, dispensational and non-dispensational theology. So let's read the quote. The bit, we marked that, Sylvia, that I need to check that sentence. The basic issue is the way we understand the historical plan and the goal of that plan through which God will bring eternal glory to himself. More specifically, it is the question of the purpose and plan of God within human history, i.e. from this creation until the inauguration of the eternal state. This inquiry involved not only the basic goal of history, but the meaning and integration of the various aspects of God's work during this period. We must understand not only what God intends to do, but how he accomplishes it. The call of Abraham, the election and formation of the nation of Israel, God dealing with the church and the nations, and the various covenant arrangements, all these are facets of the historical plan that must be integrated and understood. So, if I'm going to sort of draw this in the middle, part of what's, or write this in the middle here between these two systems of uh, dispensational and, and non-dispensational theology over here, what they're trying to find is a unified, I'm just going to say it this way, a unified purpose for redemptive history. Okay, so in other words, again, that traditionally these guys are viewed as too segregated, too divided, too, too uh, separated, and these guys want to stress only unity, and so the mediating view between them is to figure out how, you, how we can have a unified purpose of history and, and uh, sort of reconcile what the perceived differences are between these, the, the two systems on how we view that history. So he does not view the main difference here as hermeneutical. He views it as more of how they view this here. Okay. How one defines the nature of the kingdom of God is central to understanding progressive dispensationalism as a mediating position between dispensational and non-dispensational theology. Regarding this point, Susi writes, quote, Many biblical scholars, past and present, point to the concept of the kingdom of God as the theme of history. Much recent non-dispensational thinking is illustrated by Anthony uh, Hukema, who writes that, quote, the kingdom of God is the central theme of Jesus' preaching and by implication of the preaching and teaching of the apostles. And it is in the kingdom of God that we must see the real meaning of history. So the other theme that is going to come up a lot in this discussion over the next few weeks is how we're supposed, how we should view the kingdom of God. Now, really, is that anything new? Have theologians been arguing about that for centuries? Okay? You know, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, that this how one should view the kingdom of God is not necessarily a new thing, okay? But I want to take you all the way back to the beginning before Darby even. 
One of the main things that led to the advent of dispensational Bible study as a system way back in the 1800s was to understand that the kingdom was promised to who? Israel, okay? And that there was a difference between Israel and the church. All right? Now, even in Darby's time, there were other men that didn't see this the same way he did. But that, that, that issue of the, how we should view the kingdom of God is a very old subject within this discussion of theology. The purpose of history according to non-dispensational theology varies, now pay attention to this quote closely, varies on whether or not, quote, they believe that the scripture teaches a literal earthly millennial reign of Christ. Amillennialism sees the reign of Christ in the present age and therefore, quote, ends, ends to view, should say tends to view, tends to view the kingdom purpose of God in history as fundamental, fundamentally a spiritual reign over all the people of God. In contrast, premillennial non-dispensationalists view the messianic reign of Christ as including the establishment of God's will in the structure of human society and government before the mediatorial work of Christ is complete and the kingdom is delivered up by the Father or by the Father for eternity. Okay? So again, this issue of how we view the kingdom of God is going to factor heavily in these discussions um, with, with progressive dispensationalism. Um, would you agree with that concept? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You and I have talked about that yeah, we, to an extent. Yeah. Historically, non-dispensationalists has emphasized, again, the unity of the historical working of God more than dispensationalists. Regarding this emphasis on unity, there is inherent to non-dispensationalism, non-dispensational theology, uh, Susie writes in part, quote, title page four, for traditional covenant theologians, the various economies of God are the outworking of the one covenant of grace. So, a traditional, I'm going to probably do a bad job of illustrating this, but traditional covenant theology basically sees one covenant, And that this covenant then is unfolded in a series of smaller economies that relate back to one singular unified purpose. So go back to the, the quote. For traditional covenant theologians, the various economies of God are the outworking of the one covenant of grace. For others that emphasize the kingdom theme, these economies are stages in the development of God's purpose to redeem His creation from the power of sin and its effects. Basic to all non-dispensationalist thought is a unity of the people of God that does not allow for a future place and purpose for the nation of Israel in the historical plan of God's redemption. Perhaps the most commonly held perhaps most commonly held among evangelical non-dispensationalists, is that Israel is simply an incorporation of that people into the church. Okay, So one of the fundamental distinctions of non-dispensational theology is that there's how many peoples of God? One. One. Fundamental to dispensational theology is a recognizing that there's, how, that there's at least two entities or agencies one, the nation of Israel, and the second one being the body of Christ. Next paragraph. The church takes the place of Israel as the historical people of God has been, and has been endowed with all of the privileges and blessings of Israel. This is essentially the stance adopted by the Roman Catholic Church at the Second Vatican Council. The council spoke of the future incorporation of Israel within the church but made no reference to any role or purpose for Israel in God's plan. So again, non-dispensational theology typically has seen the seen Israel becoming the church. Some people will talk to talk about it as being replacing Israel or we're spiritual Israel. Some people will even uh, state it in those terms. The common thread, the common thread running through these non-dispensational views is the emphasis on the unity of the people of God. 
The concept, of a, the concept of a special future role among the nations is somehow canceled out by the non-dispensationalist regard for overriding unity. Okay? Any questions or comments about any of that? <clears throat> yeah, there have been uh, and are now, even within the covenant theology camp as represented in Grand Rapids Calvinism, uh, Reformed and Christian Reformed theologians who have believed in a future millennium and well, that's probably enough said there. I mean, that, that's not that view is not a no. Well, I'll, I'll put the end in. And as we speak, there is a professor, or he may be retired now, but he's still alive, David Hallwarden at Calvin Seminary, who in a recent book argues that the only way to read Romans 11 is to just read it as it is, and if you do, you're going to believe that Israel has a, Israel has a future. That's as far as he's willing to go. He doesn't put that in the context of any millennium himself. But D.H. Kroninga, of, who was president of Calvin Seminary a number of years ago, was, a, uh, was definitely an explicit premillennialist. That's rare in the Christian Reformed Church. It's less rare, it, it was less rare in the 19th century in the Reformed Church in America. There were a number of Reformed Church in America theologians in the 19th century who were premillennialists. <coughs> okay. So, there... These are not absolute solid, rock solid no, right. viewpoints. And I, I don't think uh, Sosi is saying so no, much. No, 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 he's, he's okay. So, next point. Um, meanwhile, traditional dispensationalism asserts a twofold purpose for God's working in history, according to uh, Sosi. Quote Traditional dispensationalism proposed a twofold purpose for God's program in history. One program related to the earth that worked out through Israel, the other related to the heaven and worked out through the church. Just as an aside, we saw that Darby is heavy in this concept of the difference between the heavenly plan of God and the earthly plan of God. That Israel is the agency of God on the earth, that the church is the agency of God for the heavens. And so th this, this is an idea that goes all the way back to the earliest, uh, I'll say, formal articulations of dispensational theology. Uh, Schaefer called this distinction the defining feature of dispensationalism. The dispensationalist believes that throughout the ages God is pursuing two distinct purposes, one which related to the earth with the earthly people and earthly objectives involved, uh, which is Judaism, while the other is related to heaven with heavenly people and heavenly objectives involved, which is Christianity. Perhaps the key distinction Perhaps the key distinction of traditional dispensationalists, therefore, is its emphasis on the distinction or discontinuities in the historical program of God while affirming an essential unit to divine dealing, to divine dealing the human... I need to check that sense too, Sylvia, I apologize. Walward explains that dispensationalism distinguishes major stewardships or purposes of God particularly as revealed in the three important dispensations of law, grace, and kingdom. Okay. Again, none of that should be new. We studied that in detail all the way through that men were holding those views. The most critical distinction in traditional dispensationalism is between Israel and the church. This separation is so sharp that the church is precluded from any present relationship to the messianic kingdom promises. That is a key point. Okay. Because, just to give you a little, a little foretaste of what is eventually going to be argued here, the, the, the progressive dispensationalists are eventually going to argue that the church is the first, shall I say, installment of the Messianic Kingdom. Um, they'll, that, that's, that, that's the way that they tend to view it, whereas the, tr the classical, the traditional dispensationalists would say that there is that Israel, the Israel and the church are divided and sort of never the twain shall meet sort of idea. Okay, um, so you definitely have sort of two, two very different ways of looking at 
it, not only Israel and the church, but also their relationship to this concept of the kingdom of God. Um, let me just finish the quote, and then I'll see if there's any questions. It is common for dispensationalists, dispensationalists to refer to the church age, the period between Pentecost and the rapture, as a parenthesis of time interrupting the messianic kingdom program. Assigning this place to the church led to the conclusion that it is not related to the messianic kingdom promises and covenants uh, on which this kingdom program rests. Although usually specific, the Davidic kingdom promises in particular, the fundamental teaching of traditional dispensationalism is that no part of the Old Testament kingdom predictions are being fulfilled in any way during this age. And that's pretty standard uh, explanation for what classical dispensationalists have historically taught. So I want you to I don't want you to lose sight of what we're trying to do here in the last ten minutes. Okay, the goal of this lesson is to familiarize you with this thinking that was occurring within evangelical theology, uh, theology in the 1990s, trying. Uh, trying to bring these, trying to figure out if there was a way that the these systems could somehow be reconciled together. Okay, and what we're reading here are attempts to explain how that how that can happen, and how or how that should happen, or how it should be viewed. In the final section of chapter one, titled "A Mediating Position," Susie presents what he believes to be the middle ground between dispensational and non-dispensational theology. As one might expect, much of the mediating view focuses on removing the discontinuities between the theological systems in terms of presenting a unified purpose for history. Quoting now, in our, in our opinion, there is a mediating position between non-dispensational and traditional dispensationalism that provides a better understanding of Scripture. This view seeks to retain a natural understanding of the prophetic scripture that appeared to assign a significant role to the nation of Israel in the future. So we, let's stop there. Progressive dispensationalism is going to maintain the belief that Israel has a distinct future. Okay, now... Did non-dispensationalism believe that? No. No, okay? So if we're, if we're trying to understand things that would define this progressive dispensationalism, this is one of them. That Israel does have a distinct future, and that this follows from, I'm just going to call it a normal reading of the Old Testament prophets. Would you agree with me? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm on the, which quote was I on? In our opinion, right? Yeah. This view seeks to retain a natural understanding of the prophetic scriptures that appear to assign a significant role to the nation of Israel in the future in accordance with the dispensational system. So, this point of progressive dispensationalism is taken from which side of the board here? The dispensational side, okay? But, it also sees the program of God as unified within history in agreement with non-dispensationalists. And it denies a radical discontinuity between the present church and the messianic kingdom promises. Okay? So, if we're sort of making our informal list here, number two would be the emphasis on unity. And they're getting that from where? the non-dispensational side. And third thing, at least according to this quote here, would be um, at, the, at the end of that, that quote where it says, when it sees the program of God as unified within history in agreement with non-dispensationalists, that's, that's a point there, and it denies a radical discontinuity between the present church and kingdom promises. So I'm going to say it this way. I'm going to say that it emphasizes continuity between the church and the kingdom promises. 
Okay? So, where is it getting point one from? Dispensational theology. Points two and three are coming primarily from where? Covenant theology. Covenant theology. Okay? So, just... I know, well, I'm not trying to be reductionist for the, for the point of just being too easy, but that's fundamentally what they're going to be arguing. Okay? And then they're going to set out <clears throat> through the rest of the books to try to explain why they feel that is the correct way of understanding things. Okay? Any questions? I had a bit of a tickle in my throat this morning. <clears throat> Susie views the kingdom as the main theme of biblical history. Therefore, he argues understanding the nature of the kingdom of God is imperative to identifying the purpose of history. Quote, as the theme of biblical history, <clears throat> the kingdom is that program through which God affects his lordship on the earth and a comprehensive salvation within history. According to biblical revelation, the focal point of the conflict between the powers of evil and the kingdom of God is the earth. The earth appears in scripture as a rebelling province of the universal kingdom of God. It is God's purpose to bring an end to this rebellion and its sinful effects, not only in history but in all creation. Thus God's kingdom, which today may be said to be over the earth, while one day, while one day be, will one day be, sorry, established on the earth. So you see the, the difference there between over the earth and on the earth. So the kingdom is over the earth now, one day it will be on the earth according to what, what uh, Susie is saying here. God's kingly rule is brought to the earth through the mediation of the kingdom of the Messiah. According to biblical prophecy, the coming of the kingdom involves the redemption of creation from all the effects of sin through the personal salvation of individuals, the socio-political salvation of the nations, and finally the salvation of the earth and heavens through recreation. This pervasive mediatorial kingdom program, ultimately fulfilled through the reign of Christ, is the, th is the theme of Scripture and the unifying principle of all God of all aspects of God's work in history. Okay, so again, what I say, this kingdom of God concept is going to be a major thing in this discussion that is being had here. Okay, Mike, you got a question? I I do, but I don't. I don't want. We'll never get finished if we get into. Well, we're not going to finish I, anyway. I, I, the thing I'm not, I'm not understanding is that they seem. These groups seem to, instead of approaching it theologically like we, like they had, we dispensational and covenant theology, they're doing something new here, fundamentally called biblical theology, and I don't really understand that very well. Does, do you under, you or Dr. Dewitt understand that a little? I'm gonna let him answer that because I, 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 I think, think I understand. The new, dar the new darling in, in seminary. Uh, it's a it, it, I, seminaries. Go ahead. If you want to reply. What we're talking here are about are types, different types of finished theology. Biblical theology and systematic theology are methods, not types of finished theology. Systematic theology organizes the biblical material by topics. Biblical theology organizes the biblical material by its historical movement through scripture. So biblical theology is simply a method of doing theology. Okay. But isn't that what these guys are doing? Well, I mean, they say so. There was, Brian even quoted them here in the beginning. Yes, they, sure. So he said that in one of the part of the yeah. quote is that he, he's in saying that he's articulating the the fun, the role of biblical theology in in, in stimulating this discussion. Uh, so there, there's, the, biblical theology is a perfectly good discipline. I, that's what I do myself. Biblical theology, not systematic theology, is my field. And it's what I've done my whole 
50 years of teaching. Not well understood by everybody, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a good discipline. And if you pay serious attention to it, you're, you're going to have, you're inevitably going to have some new thoughts about things. You can't, you can't just base everything on a stagnant, change, live to change nothing, in other words. It's not the way thinking works. It's not the way theology works either. So this is, these ideas are coming from the influence of biblical theology as a method on the enterprise, so to say. My, so my is, is it a new, her, a, a new way of doing no, no, hermeneutics? No, it's not a new hermeneutics, no. Because um, some of the application of biblical theology, where we see it in less, less than evangelical circles, is you see it, you see it in the Christian Reformed Church uh, and the Reformed circles so clearly. Women are now allowed to be ordained. Theistic evolution is on, and then the basis for it is on biblical theology. Uh, they, they, well, they, they reduce it down to culture and... and um, uh, the, within biblical theology, people who do biblical theology, there are all, kind of, there are all kinds of views of everything. Sure. It's not one... You can't you can't pin those views on in within Calvinism that you may not like. You can't pin that on biblical theology. Um, it just happens that it's central in the discussion because it's become a common practice of a number of theologians. I've even heard discussions on Sabbatarianism in the Reform circles. I mean, that's the sacred cow of Reform, yeah, and, and and it's all cultural now uh, because we've done we've done those. And they'll go through the Bible to try to show you that it's, if you do biblical theology, it'll, it'll, it'll just, it doesn't have application today, which is what the dispensation is. Well, you need, to uh, to, you need to do some reading in what biblical theology is about. Well, and, that's why I'm, ask, I'm asking, though, but uh, I, I, it's confusing to me. Yeah, I understand that, and I've tried to explain a little bit about it. And, but it's, it's, it is a method of theology, it's not a finished theology. No, it's not, a, it's not a theological viewpoint, it's a theological method. But, but that's what these guys are doing, right? They are influenced by biblical theology. <clears throat> because they're working on a historical thinking basis, not on a, 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 a set of logically different categories <coughs> that systematic theology sets up. But how does that differ from grammatical historical theology, which all dispensationalists claim to adhere to? Historical grammatical uh, interpretation of scripture is the basic method of interpreting the Bible that's characteristic of all these types of theology. And, and all these theological methods. We get that from the Reformation. Is there a, um, a primer book that you would recommend if somebody wanted to read more about biblical theology? Other than Paul Enns' uh, Hank Moody handbook on theology, which got a little chapter in it. Yeah, there. read my article in the current journal. All right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I'm serious about that. I will do. The I title do. of it is Biblical Theology, Systematic Theology, and the Dispensation of Promise Correlating the Biblical the Dispensation. <laughs> That'll tell you quite a bit. Um, well, so rather than forging ahead at this point, we're at the bottom of page five. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll just, it, it is nine o'clock, it's actually a minute after. So what we'll do is, what's that? Ten when you're done filming, can you take a picture of this board for me on that camera so I can have a remembrance of what I've written on there? <laughs> uh, so what we'll do, folks, is we'll just suspend the notes at the bottom of page five, and then what I'm going to do for next week is I'll take what we, I'll lift what we didn't cover, I'll put it at the top of the next lesson so that I can build where we want to go next. So what we want to do next, just to give you a heads up, is I want to talk. I want, to, I want to follow Blasing and Bach's book, because in the first chapter they talk about this type, of, this type of dispensationalism, this type of dispensationalism, and this type of dispensationalism in four or five consistent themes as a methodology of comparing how each one of these types of dispensationalism is different from the previous.
okay? So we will finish this overall view, the, the mediating view that the progressive dispensationalists are arguing for, and then we'll look at specific, more specific details about what each type of dispensational theology is arguing and why they're arguing, okay? So I appreciate your attention, and I uh, hope you guys have a good week. We'll see you next week in this, uh, at 9, 9 a.m.